I'm a trainer by trade, Mike. I got the gift of gab. So I always did the public speaking. And when I wrote the book, I said, look, to the publisher, I said, look, I'm not about selling books. He said, well, I'm about selling books. I said, well, I'm about training. I'm about workshops. I'm about people in a room together. Well, that's where we just saw a good space, a good, good fit. It was self-preservation. Uh, I started getting into emotional intelligence back in, it came out in about the 90s. So, you know, you gotta think back, where were you in the 1990s? But um, I, I needed direction, you know. I flew off the handle a lot as an athlete. I choked a lot of, as an athlete. So I needed some instruction. And, you know, from mentors and surrounding myself with people, I ended up studying emotional intelligence. <laughs> So I would go to corporate and I deliver emotional intelligence training and it's typically with leadership. And about five or six years ago, I had a dear friend of mine, Dr. Garrison. Uh, he came to me with a young athlete up in Winfield and he said, can you work with this boy? And that's where I started getting back into athletics. And, and I realized that because of emotional intelligence, it's a self analysis. You're looking at your own voice in your head. You're looking at your own emotions. And then you're, you're recognizing them when they're working against you. So athletics is a perfect spot for what we call emotional maturity or emotional skills. Uh, and then with the latest in neuroscience over the last couple of years, we now see the emotional brain. And it's really just kind of validated. We, we now know that the choke, if you will, is because of performance anxiety. We, we're getting nervous. <laughs> I did, a, um, I did a, a coach's event, and I hear this all the time. Coach will stand up and he says, you know, in the bullpen or at practice, we're getting 90 out of him. But we get him in the game, and the best we can get is 75. And it's fleeting success at best, you know, occasional hit and miss. So, well, that's, there's enough evidence that physically he's strong enough. But yet, when you mount pressure, and that's the key, pressure, everything changes. <laughs> The, the Journal of Science and Sports Medicine was first published an article in 2010 on the validity of emotional intelligence in sports. That's only a couple of years ago. So this whole idea about emotions and being smart about your emotions is a relatively new conversation. A hundred percent. And actually, we get a lot of calls from parents. A lot of parents, you know, they got young student athletes. They're wanting the best for them. They're wanting to get the scholarships. And they're always asking, what can I do for, for my young student athlete to get the best out of them? So we call it uh, maturity mentoring. But there's ways and ideas, there's techniques, there's conversations that we can have with our young athletes that, that build these emotional skills. <laughs> If I'm going to train you, the first development step is to be self-aware. Well, the natural question is, okay, well, self-aware of what? It's a voice in your head. That's the first step. We've got to recognize the chatter. But now, just like you mentioned, there's been a lot of books and conversations about mental. I'm talking with the um, director of recruiting for the Saints. And he says, Parrish, love your book, love your ideas, but I got to tell you, we did some of that psychological training before and it didn't work. And I said, well, coach, we now know why. We know now just within the last couple years why. You can do your mental training, but if you don't connect it to the heartstrings, if you don't do emotional training, you're going to miss it. You're just going to have a, a good training session and some jokes that's not going to sustain itself. And that's been the most recent way we've been trying to communicate it is most coaches, most athletes look at a one dimension when it comes to human development. And it's usually physical. Show up early, stay a little later, add some more weight, do the rep a little different, get the right nutrition, 
it's all one dimensional. Well, now with new science, we've recognized you got to take a three dimensional approach. <laughs> Through science, we've recognized you got to take a three-dimensional approach. You got to do the mental, you got to do the emotional, then you look at the physical. The, the hidden secret is that the physical is a direct result of the mental and the emotional. So again, we've got to get the visualization technique. I want these mental pictures popping up. I want this in your chatter. But let's talk about your emotional states. See, that's what new science tells us is that you can have, and we've all experienced an emotional hijack. When we get emotional and we get frustrated and frazzled, we've all experienced that. That's the other dimension that we've got to get a handle on. The way we teach it in the book is there are two independent th subjects, thoughts, the chatter, and emotional states. They're worthy of a study by themselves but yet they're directly connected and it's so subtle we miss it. But that's where the new science says, whoa, the emotional brain is where it's all at. Performance anxiety is the number one cause of poor performance for athletes. Anxiety is an emotion. You gotta take a three-dimensional. And what we see there is it's got to be a mental, and then you go, then you get the emotional state, and which, you know, the emotional state, and then we get the physical. This is what's lacking. You know, I got my little stick figure guy here, and in the book we talk about kind of the idea is to break up the brain, and you got, you got, a, you got a mental brain or thinking brain, and you got emotional brain. Where's that chatter though? Well, the chatter is in the prefrontal cortex. It's right here. So the chatter is just running. Here's the chatter. Now, whenever the emotional brain senses a threat, it can literally hijack the thinking brain. And what that means is that the emotional brain, it hijacks, but it sends stress hormones down into the adrenal gland. And all of a sudden, just based on the chatter, it, you know, we've all heard fear, false images appealing rear. This chatter, if it's going crazy on the negative, an emotional hijack comes in, adrenaline gets shot down to the adrenal glands, and the next thing you know, we get a flood of stress hormones. Well, if decision making is critical in sports, which we know it is, decision making, millisecond to millisecond, you know, you're off a little bit, the ball doesn't go in the hole. If you're just off a little bit, the ball goes around the rim and shoots out. So, decision making in a sports, on a three-dimensional approach says that I've got the right chatter, so that means I've got the right words and mental pictures, I've got the right emotional states, so that means I've got the right adrenaline mix or stress hormones in the body for the task at hand, and that's what's critical. Doesn't matter the sport, doesn't matter the task, doesn't matter the size of the ball. What matters is do we have an alignment which is, that's what we call optimal. This is optimal. When the chatter's right, the emotional state's right, the physical will follow. Now we've got what they call optimal performance. Optimal means there's the right amount of hormones in the system for the task at hand. This is what we teach.